Welcome everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all of you. For, thank you for joining us. My name is Matt Rojanski. I'm director of the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. We're really pleased to be able to host today's timely event on corporate governance reform in Ukraine, the case of NAFTA gas, of course. Uh, as you all likely know, the government of Ukraine recently announced the dismissal of NAFTA gas's CEO, which prompted an outcry in Ukraine, as well as uh, many uh, quite uh, firm reactions, I would say, from Western governments and companies uh, that do business with Ukraine, from IFIs. It raised some important questions uh, related to financial support for the Ukrainian government, uh, as well as political questions. Um, the events prompted a debate about whether overall the actions that we are seeing uh, constitute progress on corporate governance reform or rollback, uh, whether they'll lead to increased efficiency in the state-owned companies uh, of Ukraine or not. Uh, and of course, this was very much on the agenda for Secretary of State Antony Blinken's uh, recent uh, visit to Kiev at the head of a delegation this week, um, and has remained very much in the press, and I would say is, is still an unresolved issue. We have uh, a truly blue ribbon panel to address this topic for you today. Um, it's, it's a hot topic. We hope that this discussion uh, will serve to illuminate, to add light and not heat uh, so much to the hot topic. Uh, but of course, each of these experts has a tremendous background, which uh, my wonderful, distinguished colleague, uh, Kennan Institute Deputy Director Will Pomerantz will tell you about briefly. Um, I will not do justice in my introduction to Will, which is utterly unfair, but it is in the interest of time and for all of you to get more questions in. Before I introduce Will and hand the floor to him, let me just remind you, uh, take a look at our publications, uh, Focus Ukraine and the Russia File, which you can get to uh, through the Kennan Institute's website, as well as our podcasts, which you can find on the same link. And uh, it wouldn't be Washington if I didn't shamelessly plug our new book, uh, fairly new anyway by academic book standards, uh, but it's a history, a contemporary history of Ukraine called uh, somewhat cheekily from the Ukraine to Ukraine. And it, and it takes a deep dive uh, in a wide variety of perspectives on the history of the last 30 years in Ukraine, uh, from democracy uh, to energy to art and culture. Um, we hope that it'll be a useful teaching tool. And what's very unique about this book, and, and I'm pleased to have some of them with us today, is that it combines the perspectives of Ukrainian and Western ex experts on Ukraine, which is truly unique for a book of this kind. So take a look at it. You can also get to it through the Kennan Institute website. Without any further delay, uh, Will Pomerantz, as I said, Deputy Director of the Kennan Institute, uh, deeply experienced in matters related to corporate governance, legal reform, and in particular, constitutionalism, which is at the heart, I think one could fairly say, of all of these issues. Uh, the rights that individuals, as well as legal persons like corporations, enjoy and should have the transparency that goes with building a functioning economy and a democracy uh, in Ukraine today. So, Will, I know you're going to ably lead our discussion. Thank you all, panelists, so much. Um, I am uh, going to step back now and hand you the floor. Thank you very much, Matt, uh, for that introduction and welcome to our panelists and everyone who is tuning in today. Uh, I think we're just going to begin uh, with our discussion, with our presentations, and our first speaker will be uh, Pavlo Klimkin. He is the former Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs from 2014 to 2019 and the former Ukrainian Ambassador Extraordinaire and Plenipotentiary to Germany from 2012 to 2014. He has dealt with all matters dealing with the integration of Ukraine into Europe, including leading Ukrainian delegations and negotiations on the association agreement and the uh, visa-free regime between Ukraine and the EU. So without further ado, uh, Ambassador Klimkin, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening or good morning, uh, depending on where you are, everybody. It's uh, it's great uh, to have uh, to have such a chat. It's of course uh, quite a timely exercise. Uh, and Matt, you presented us uh, your contemporary history of Ukraine, and uh, we will definitely read it and and of course criticize your approach uh, how it should be. But uh, recent events, uh, I believe, uh, deserve to be included in such a contemporary history. It's not uh, something which is, uh, which is mediocre, even uh, if you see the realities uh, in Ukraine. So because uh, 
I'm I'm the first one uh, to speak. Uh, let me be let me be as brief as possible and simply map out uh, a couple of key points. How I see <clears throat> where we are now, without uh, going deeper into the history of what happened, and I believe uh, either Andrian or Natalia could uh, could go a bit deeper, and it it could be helpful. So I believe what happened uh, basically represents uh, three types uh, of different breaches. One fundamental breach, and the first one is, uh, is about a breach of our corporate governance. And uh, we started uh, the whole uh, corporate governance uh, reform from the scratch uh, years ago, uh, and it was uh, muddling through uh, with, uh, with a lot of difficulties uh, because the fundamental point about that, there is no culture of corporate governance in Ukraine. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's about political influence or better to say about political manipulations when you see how state enterprises in Ukraine uh, uh, being managed and actually were managed. It's, uh, it's a part of a uh, corrupt style of Ukrainian uh, policy because uh, now it's, uh, it's a lot being said about oligarchs, about uh, uh, combating corruptions, uh, yeah, totally right points. But uh, manipulating uh, state enterprises uh, he was and is one of the main source of corruption and twisted reality in Ukrainian politics. So what happened? And again, uh, nafta gas, uh, he, I would not say, well, let me rephrase it. I would not say it's the best possible example of corporate governance. And if you see if the results, it's mixed. It's, it's really mixed. But uh, given uh, the Ukrainian perspective in Ukrainian realities, uh, it was uh, one of the examples how corporate governance uh, should be at least a starting point for managing state enterprises. And there were clearly a number of achievements, uh, both uh, economic uh, ones, uh, and maybe Andrian will talk about that uh, a, bit, uh, a bit further later, but also legal ones, especially in Stockholm. And we know it was uh, groundbreaking for Ukraine uh, to win all these case, all, all this cases. It's, it's really groundbreaking. So to cut myself short about the first, uh, the first breach, uh, for me, it's a real bre breach of, uh, of corporate governance. Uh, it's going to spill over in other areas and to other state enterprises. It's going to have quite a negative impact uh, to our railways, for example. And, uh, and to other state enterprises. Uh, so fundamentally, it uh, is just, uh, just the beginning. So the second breach for me is, uh, is a clear breach of uh, our anti-corruption legislation. Because uh, the new guy uh, who is appointed by the cabinet of ministers, uh, Yuri Vitrenko, and let me say clearly, for me, it's, uh, it's not about personalities. I know both of them, Andrei Kobolev and Yuri Vitrenko, from uh, our legal cases. And the foreign ministry provided uh, uh, assistance uh, to the Nafagas team in all these cases. Basically, if you, uh, if you take the legal position, in, uh, of course, uh, in, in the sense of, uh, in the sense of uh, law itself and, uh, and legal approach, uh, it has been taken from, uh, from the foreign ministry and from our lawyers and from Naftagas lawyers. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, now we see Mr. Vitrenko appointed uh, and it's in clear breach 
if uh, if I see the legal ground uh, against our anti-corruption law, especially the Article 26. Uh, and here is clearly stipulated uh, that someone could not be appointed uh, to the position uh, right after he oversaw uh, any state enterprise. Uh, and of course, we could discuss politically whether Mr. Vitrenka had kind of uh, kind of real powers to oversee NAFTA gas. But I understand uh, there are letters, at least one letter where he provided an assessment for, for the NAFTA gas activities and especially for the advisory council. So fundamentally what I hear from different lawyers and actually I ask a couple of them, it's a clear breach of anti-corruption legislation. And uh, the third one, and for me the most important one, it's a clear breach of trust both uh, within the country and actually for our key partners. And of course, uh, in, the sense of, uh, in the sense of Ukraine, it's difficult to sustain the same level of effort on corporate governance, on the whole sense of being uh, okay, let's say, in a different way, becoming more transparent uh, and uh, taking over uh, best practices, or at least good practices. Best, best practices is probably too much at the moment uh, for Ukraine. Let's say good practices. Uh, if we have uh, such, uh, such an example, and for our partners, uh, and uh, Tony's Blinken visit uh, was a good example for that, it's a, it's a clear attempt uh, to roll uh, down uh, the, uh, the reform effort. And uh, it's a clear perception of backsliding. And uh, I've been uh, called by a number of people, both journal journalists uh, and politicians and experts uh, in, recent, uh, in recent days, and asked Pablo, actually, what's, what's going on? Fundamentally, what is important for us in our assessment of Ukrainian reforms is just about justice reform, combating corruption, Delarchization and uh, and actually energy, so it's for uh, for us uh, these are clear benchmarks uh, in uh, in our assessment. So fundamentally, it's gonna spill out to other areas to our position on the Nord Stream two on other projects on security related stuff, and what happened fundamentally weakened up our position in their fight, and I really mean it. Uh, what's uh, the way forward? Uh, very, very concise. I know that on Tuesday, there should be a meeting uh, between the prime minister and the advisory council. The advisory council's position is, is crystal clear. It's about principles and values, and it's about, uh, you know, legal approach. Uh, and it's about letting the advisory council to pick up, uh, you know, a real candidate uh, through transparent and uh, yeah, through transparent uh, competition. Was it going to happen? I have strong doubt, but uh, we could discuss uh, the way forward, uh, the way forward later. Uh, but my, my impression from different discussion with, uh, with our friends and partners uh, that uh, simply doing nothing on that is clearly not a way forward. Because at the end of the day, uh, it, uh, it's going to ruin our perception and our sense uh, on where, where we've, we've been hidden to. And uh, the sense of perception uh, of our goal for reforms, uh, and basically how we we could and should pull off these reforms. Uh, Mr. Kobolev, uh, whether you like him or not, uh, has not been even informed on the oncoming process. Uh, and and for me, it fundamentally runs counter to everything. Uh, I believe in, uh, you know, the transparent and fair procedure. 
So uh, a lot, uh, a lot to discuss in the future. But uh, to cut it short again, we created uh, ourselves the fundamental problems. We now, uh, we now should uh, should sort out and sort out in a way should present us uh, as uh, as someone uh, who looks uh, into the future and uh, not into the past. Uh, and looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you very much, Ambassador Klimkin. I uh, will now turn to Natalia Katzer uh, Pushovska. Sorry about that, Pushovska. Uh, she is the co founder and CEO of the Ukrainian Sustainable Fund, a former member of the Ukrainian Parliament, and she also works as an energy and investment advisor uh, at the Ukrainian Institute for the Future. So, Natalia, the, the floor is yours. Yes, good day everyone. It's a big pleasure and honor to speak today here. And uh, as uh, Pavlo mentioned about uh, the future that we should think about what we do have now and what will be the, our energy future in Ukraine, I was asked to make a uh, overseen of our energy market, especially gas market, as we are talking now of, uh, about NAFTA gas. Uh, and uh, I want to point out the key urgent issues which would be uh, these governments faced uh, now. Uh, so let me share with you a presentation. Uh, I think uh, uh, just one moment, just one moment, uh, and we'll go. Um, uh, We'll go through it. Can you see it now? Uh, okay, I think yes, yes. Uh, great. Uh, so um, uh, here I, as I say, about the uh, urgent issue uh, of the Ukrainian gas industry. Um, and uh, one moment, I... Uh, okay, well, it, it's moving now. Uh, so first of all, I would say that we are we are not at the middle, but we are proceeding with our gas market reform. And uh, the first challenge uh, which Ukraine uh, is uh, facing uh, is, of course, uh, we should uh, continue our gas market reform. Um, I also will tell about uh, uh, what, uh, that uh, increase of, we also need to increase our gas production as it falling now. Uh, well, increase the uh, Ukrainian interconnectivity with neighboring state because interconnectivity of our gas market, it means security for us as we need to diversify uh, flows and sources of uh, natural gas. Uh, then uh, gas transportation system is vitally important not only for uh, market and pro as a big source of profit for our budget, but also as a security means uh, uh, in terms of our geopolitical position. And the last one, uh, uh, which is now vitally important, is to develop regional gas hub. And here we have uh, gas storages with, which could be utilized uh, and bring uh, additional liquidity to our market. So as we will move uh, uh, quickly through these points, uh, let me start from gas production. Uh, so if you, uh, as you see from uh, the chart uh, in 2000. 12, uh, we uh, experienced slight uh, decrease of gas production. Uh, and mainly, Ukrhazvodobovania, uh, which state owned company and uh, it belongs to Nafto Gas Group, uh, shows uh, a decrease in production, uh, slight decrease, while private companies uh, increase their production. So it's actually raised a question. Uh, and uh, first of all, uh, it, uh, the reason is, of course, market forces, as market was not very good uh, in 2020 for gas extraction companies. But at the same time, as we see, uh, private companies shows results. Uh, so here uh, we have a good, very good prospects for Nafto Gas Group, as uh, uh, last couple of years they acquired four out of seven gas fields uh, during the uh, production agreement competition. Uh, actually, I also take part into this uh, uh, competition and uh, organization and uh, Nafto Gas has a very good chance uh, uh, to invest in these fields. Last year, they also acquired uh, Yuzivska and Delfin uh, 
uh, gas fields, which is on, on shore in um, Delphine in uh, Black Sea. So now the um, key the key uh, task is first of all uh, to attract investments and then to explore these gas fields uh, to increase our natural gas production. By the way, here we actually consume, Ukraine consumes uh, 30, 34 BCM, and we um, produced 20 BC, almost 20 BCM. So we imported, still imported from uh, 12 to 14 BCM, depending on years. Uh, so gas transport transmission system, it's not direct enough to gas responsibility after unbundling, but I will also uh, stop at this point as it's vitally important for our uh, system. Uh, energy security as well. So as you see from chart, um, uh, we have a contract to transit gas through our gas transportation system with Gazprom and uh, uh, use this for Russia. But you see in 2020, uh, we plumbed 55 BCM and now for, as the numbers decrease significantly. Even enough, uh, Gazprom pays for 40 BCM per year. Uh, they use just 14 BCM at the moment and uh, transmission, uh, transmission is uh, de de decreasing. Uh, so, uh, well, it's always, uh, it's also uh, due to the big wish of uh, Gazprom to bypass Ukraine. So they are waiting for Nord Stream. Uh, so they are trying to decrease volumes. And at this point, I would say we should see what it would be after 2024 when uh, gas uh, a transmission contract will end up, first of all. And second issue is the volume become too low. The system functioning would be also under question, and it would uh, and gas transmission system operator will will uh, experience losses. So here we should think about not only waste but new sources of gas and where we can take uh, uh, molecular to fill our uh, gas transportation system. Uh, well, um, a very good, a very good development. Uh, on the gas storages, uh, so it was not before 20, 2019 when we use it uh, as a commercial entity. Uh, now uh, it belongs to our NAFTA gas group, but it shows very good results when companies uh, uh, plumb gas. I mean, uh, gas uh, traders, Ukrainian and uh, foreign. You see. Uh, uh, states uh, uh, which company use our gas storages uh, over the season to plant gas, to store it over the summer, and then uh, re export it uh, to uh, Europe and neighboring states. So we have 31 BCM uh, gas storages. It actually 25% of uh, European storage market, and it makes Ukraine very important and useful uh, for, uh, for the system uh, to balance markets uh, during the seasons. And here we have opportunity and uh, something to offer for LNG traders, uh, for uh, gas traders to use our storages and the price is not so high. So here you can see uh, on the graph that uh, uh, the dynamics of uh, gas injection into our system. Uh, and um, if you look on previous uh, slide, uh, so uh, our government changed regulation and now the customer can use a warehouse regime. It's without taxation. If you use it uh, during 1000 days, if you store gas during 1000 days, which makes uh, this tool very profitable and interesting. And if you see the uh, comparison between price for storage in Ukraine and the neighboring states, you see that we are pretty competitive. So here we can offer even uh, US companies to store Gas and then resell it to the market. Uh, so uh, next, next slide, uh, why I'm saying about the organization in terms of when we are talking about gas. So it's uh, like a, a worldwide trend and Ukraine very committed to decrease uh, to decrease uh, uh, CO2 emission and energy plays a very important role. So at this point, uh, I see and we consider natural gas to be marginal power of energy transition. We should use gas uh, to substitute 
uh, coal generation, which constitutes 30% of our, uh, our um, uh, heat and power generation. So first of all, uh, cheap gas, cheap resources, and here I mean LNG as well, can substitute coal at the first stage, and it's twice as uh, uh, efficient and clean, cleaner than, for instance, simple coal. Uh, so as we're looking very quickly, I would say that uh, here we need not only cleaner, but also cheaper resource. And uh, I advocate the uh, uh, possibility to transport gas, uh, LNG gas uh, to Ukraine through uh, different ways. I mean, Lithuania, Grotia, Poland. Uh, we can also uh, do it through the Black Sea as we are mar mar uh, marine company, uh, country and has a very good, well-developed in port infrastructure. Uh, so uh, to sum up, uh, and uh, I would say that it's not only uh, uh, we should be discussed as a one another crisis in the world uh, from from US and uh, but Ukraine could uh, be a very good partner and we have uh, uh, something to offer. First of all, Ukraine could be partner in decarbonization and here we can attract not only technology, develop green energy, but use gas LNG as a marginal power more cheaper and uh, more cleaner to substitute coal. Second, we are very interesting to increase our interconnectivity uh, because for us it's uh, obvious it's security and to bring new sources of gas. I mean, uh, uh, liquefied gas as well through the different routes, uh, including Black Sea. And for sure, we are very interested in technology and could be a partner uh, for US uh, in the carbonization and use uh, uh, different, different technology to decrease CO2 emission and to make our system more efficient. I mean, smart grids, electromobility, green tech, uh, and we are not forgot about uh, hydrogen, which is actually a topic for uh, another another big uh, presentation. But I would stop here uh, just to have you a picture where we are and where we are uh, heading to. Okay. Thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, for those of you who are watching, I want to uh, bring you into the conversation. You can send questions to our speakers by email to mm -hmm. kenan at wilsoncenter.org. You can tweet us at Kennan Institute or post on our Facebook page. Please include your name and affiliation when asking questions. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll turn to our next speaker, who is Andrian Prokip. Uh, Andrian is a senior associate on Ukraine with the Kennan Institute, a former Fulbright scholar, and a prolific author of uh, many books on articles dealing with geopolit the, the geopolitics of energy in Europe. Andrian, the floor is yours. Thanks, Will. I'll try to be short as much as possible. So uh, that's true that uh, there are a lot of disputes uh, regarding the way how uh, government dismissed uh, Kovalev. Uh, and we had so many talks uh, here in Ukraine on this, but mostly these talks are about the form, but not about the substance. And the substance is uh, how effective was the reform towards and after gas, how efficient was the management uh, in terms of uh, financial and operational results. And I think that so, and, and um, substance uh, is uh, the results. And I think uh, I just want to talk about uh, some results that I suppose pushed uh, government or contributed uh, to this uh, decision uh, to dismiss Kavalev in such a specific uh, way, which is a matter of argument. So the first point uh, is prices uh, just for households. Just two days before um, government dismissed Kovalev, NAFTA has announced uh, prices for households for the next year, and these were higher than we had uh, during this regulated period. Considering that NAFTA has is a market maker. That means that all other suppliers will uh, offer the same or higher price. And that's not only just about um, paternalism or Zelensky's uh, promises, who actually promised to provide lower prices, but also about another important issue. Because five years ago, uh, when this reform started, this was, was an idea to liberalize prices 
which means actually increasing prices and extra revenues have to be used to promote um, domestic gas production. And there was a state uh, program to increase gas production for 30 percent between 2015 and now. And as you saw from Natalia's slides, we actually didn't have uh, increase in uh, this production. So we had even a uh, slight drop. So that was, uh, I think, um, that uh, NAFTA has failed to um, increase gas production was another one serious reason for um, government. The, second, the third reason, sure, that was uh, financial result, uh, these losses, however, again, uh, we have serious debates here in Ukraine. Uh, should it like is it important to have uh, to um, take into account this one year losses or not? The fourth reason, uh, as I believe, uh, that was um, that NAFTA has was buying equipment from Russia. Uh, so in, in early of March, there was uh, this deal that uh, NAFTA has didn't buy equipment from Ukrainian factory, and I'm sure that this irritated government as well. Because uh, immediately after that, government banned uh, import of such equipment from Russia. And uh, uh, the final point, which I suppose um, irritated government, was that uh, the supervisory board didn't react um, in the way that government expected. And so they expected like, uh, to make some pressure on uh, top management of Kobolev. Uh, however, um, that wasn't done. And uh, another one point, it's, it's about salaries. There's a serious discussion regarding uh, top management salaries. And uh, OECD corporate uh, management uh, principles and rule, these stipulate that uh, payments to top management uh, should be done in extra high transport level. And unfortunately, so there was not enough transparency regarding these salaries in NAFTA House report. So I think at final extent, all these reasons pushed um, government uh, to, uh, to, to take the step or at least contributed to some other reasons that uh, government uh, had with this. And uh, regarding the future of uh, NAFTA gas, so I believe that um, personally, uh, UCO Vitrenko uh, will not do something bad uh, because so. There was a team, Kobolev and Trenko, who came to Nafta House uh, in 2014, and both are dedicated to market approach. So uh, on the one hand, as I see that we will not have serious um, bad impact from inside of the Nafta House. However, yes, so as we see now, uh, we have some, um, uh, some concern, especially from Western partners. So I'm fine with this uh, and ready for Q&A after the session. Thank you very much, Andrian. Uh, again, I, if you want to uh, ask a question and participate in our discussion, you can send the questions to our speakers via email at kennan at wilsoncenter.org. You can tweet us at Kennan Institute or post on our Facebook page. Again, please uh, include your name and affiliation when you do so. Uh, our last speaker and concluding speaker will be Victor Andrusov who is the executive director of the Ukrainian Institute for the Future, uh, which specializes in national, national security, international and internal politics, economics, law, and educational reforms. Victor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, William. Uh, so uh, the key uh, point of the discussion and uh, actually why we get so much attention to what has happened in Naftogaz is the case of the corporate management reform in Ukraine. And um, I have to say that the case of Naftogaz is the trigger, which actually uh, shows that this reform was uh, pretty much imitated than really implemented. So uh, with, with this case, we can see and look now deeper what actually was going on uh, with the corporate management reform. And if we talk about uh, this reform, we should not talk only about uh, nafta gas. We should also look, for example, for other companies, banks, and uh, organizations where uh, the supervisory boards were implemented, and uh, and and uh, how they were acting. So uh, we, 
we have a lot of violations during this reform at the beginning, and now all these uh, problems finally lead to the situation as uh, we, which happened in Neftogas. And I'm sure the next months we also will have a big problems uh, in uh, Ukrainian railway um, company and, and maybe in some others like Cooker Energo and, uh, and so on. Uh, the, prob the first problem was that uh, trying to defend uh, companies from the uh, intervention uh, from the government, actually we, we pushed uh, the uh, supervisory boards to have uh, agreements with uh, management. And we, I have to say that in Ukraine, the boards are dependent on the management because they are paid of the huge salaries, uh, but the decision is adopted uh, about these payments by the management of the company. And uh, you have to understand just for example, that the head of the uh, supervisory board of Ukrainian railway got four times more uh, uh, salary than uh, uh, a head of the supervisory board of Deutsche Bank. And you know, this is not uh, uh, the way we can compare our GDP with Germany, yes, to get to, to, to pay him so much money. The next problem was that uh, most of uh, appointed members of the boards uh, were ma made in, in very in transparent way. For example, there is no possibility to get the contracts uh, of, of these members of the boards. That they are uh, under, under secret and, and they are closed for public and even for a uh, member of parliament uh, just for the second. And this is also violates the principles of OECD regarding the corporate management. The next problem was that there is no concrete uh, KPI of the, uh, of, the, of the supervisory board members, what they actually do uh, and how we can uh, make any uh, estimation whether they effective or not, uh, whether they act successfully or not. And, and this is uh, all a case which uh, is all over all the companies. Uh, for also, for example, uh, so I have to say that corporate management actually uh, turned in Ukraine, this reform, uh, has turned in uh, some way, I would say, legal, legal corruption. When people got uh, legally huge money without any understanding about what actually are their uh, tasks and, 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 and achievements. So, and uh, that's why we have a lot of other different strange stories. For example, Mr. Junior, who is the head of the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian railway company, he was at the beginning a member of uh, committee, uh, nominee uh, uh, committee, who was actually selecting people for the, uh, for the participation in supervisory board. But later he lobbied himself in three boards at once. He was a member of, 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 of the supervisory board in three companies at once. And, and it took a, a half a year from the government to, uh, to, to, to leave him only in one company. So, so I, I have to say that we are now, uh, because of the situation in Naftogaz, we should look uh, more deeper in this reform. And when we will do that, we will we'll see that a lot of things were just imitation. And the lot of things that we, which were uh, presented as a huge success was only imitation of the reform. Because uh, uh, other companies are almost at the bankruptcy, but at the same time, the supervisory boards always support the management of the company because they depend on on the money paid by the management of the company. So this is also the case of the nafta gas. But we will see a huge problems in the next months in other companies. And finally, I have to say that uh, we, uh, if we will look to the case of nafta gas, there is a lot of signs of uh, possible conspiracy between the board members and uh, the management uh, in the face of Mr. Kobolev. Uh, I have uh, to mention that, for example, half a year ago, uh, it was published uh, aud uh, the audit report about the NAFTA gas by the, the state uh, audit service. And uh, it showed that the company made violation on more than $3 billion. But uh, this uh, supervisory board did not react to this audit and only the things they were disturbed, 
that this report was leaked to the journalists. And the same was after uh, as a, a financial report. They did not react it to, uh, to the, the real situation which has happened. And this was the losses of the company uh, by, by the end of the year. And uh, meantime, you have to know that uh, in 2020, uh, the board members and the top management of company have doubled the sums of their salary and, and, and other, other money they received. So we, we have to now uh, really look what was wrong in, in this reform and we should consider to bring it to a really successful case. It's not just only about to say that it was successful. Now, having the case is enough to gas, we have to look what was the real problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Again, if uh, we're gonna turn to questions uh, to our audience. Uh, and as a reminder, you can uh, send your questions by email uh, to kenan at wilsoncenter.org. You can tweet us at Kenan Institute or post on our Facebook page. But our first question comes from our director, Matthew Rujanski, and he wants to know about in, uh, the commitment of President Zelensky uh, to reform in light of recent developments and as measured against the IMF expectations. So uh, what are the uh, ramifications for Zelensky and his political program and his future actions in light of this, um, this controversy over corporate governance and Naftagas. So um, I'll ask uh, Ambassador Klimkin to start that, uh, start, that, start the uh, ball rolling. Um, you probably heard uh, that uh, all of the press conf uh, after the visit, uh, IMF uh, was mentioned uh, both by by Anthony and uh, and by the President Zelensky in a slightly different way, but still, it was mentioned uh, like a kind of uh, kind of benchmark uh, for delivering on, on key reforms and cooperation with uh, with the IMF is something uh, is something what uh, what matters. So it does not mean that uh, everything which is now under discussion uh, would be uh, would be delivered, and the discussion is uh, is quite uh, is quite tricky. Ukraine clearly needs uh, cooperation with the IMF, especially you know having. Uh, having probably a negative twist uh, in our economy towards, uh, towards this fall. Because uh, now if you uh, compare commodity prices uh, for key Ukrainian export products, like metal and agriculture products, uh, they are quite okay. It's still possible uh, to get uh, financial resources uh, from, uh, from outside uh, through, uh, through different channels. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to predict, uh, but uh, uh, key economists believe it's going to deteriorate towards, uh, towards this fall. Uh, so uh, IMF uh, would be much needed and the deal with the IMF would be much needed. Uh, and uh, we all understand uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's about key points. We could discuss it separately, but corporate governance and managing state enterprises is something which, uh, which is a backbone of Ukrainian politics. Uh, we, I would say not a good backbone. And I, I believe uh, that the whole uh, corporate governance reform uh, is, is, is really mixed. It's, uh, we can say it's good, we can say it is bad. Uh, so uh, the future negotiations with the IMF would definitely focus on not just what happened, but what should happen on key points on uh, corporate, uh, corporate governance reform. 
it would be one of the key points and it's mentioned by the IMF already now. Thank, thank you, uh, Pavlo. Uh, Natalia is, is uh, raising her hand. Yes, uh, um, a very interesting question. First of all, uh, as to whether IMF reform could bring uh, brings real value into, into Ukrainian market and how it correlates with uh, fight with corruption. So what actually I may ask uh, in change of uh, cheap resources for the state is to proceed with market reform. And uh, here is a controversy between uh, uh, president and his team understanding uh, that uh, there should be low price for uh, electricity, gas, etc. cetera, for, for population. And for instance, uh, to proceed with reform, which ask I but I truly believe that corruption could be beat only by systemic changes. I mean, for instance, when we implemented in 2015 gas market law, we eliminate uh, um, automatically all uh, intermediaries on gas market, which uh, create a, a, a field for corruption. So here we also can proceed with reform and to lower price for gas and uh, other other resources just to implement more liquidity uh, to bring more uh, traders to uh, attract new sources for gas. So there is not controversy between IMF requirements and our state needs. There should be only right implementation and uh, keep a deep understanding of how market forces could uh, um, could transform our markets. And uh, gas market is very good example as we now have market price, uh, direct contracts, and even households can now uh, choose the supplier whom they uh, from whom they want to buy. And it is the end point of our gas market reform. And it could be implemented in electricity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here is just uh, need political will, deep understanding, and uh, will to push this reform forward. Okay. Thank you, yep. thank, thank you Natalia. Um, I want to follow up with uh, Victor and, and Andrian about these supervisory boards, because it seems that they were uh, not really conceived as oversight, but were totally dependent on the actual corporations. And I, I just want to know who was the, who, who, who was the, who provided the vision uh, for this type of corporate reform? Uh, was it international investors? Was it international uh, agencies? Who was behind this corporate reform? And did they understand uh, the intricacies of the Ukrainian market? I, I, I'm not sure I can tell you the names of the people, <laughs> but uh, this uh, actually reform was very much, uh, IMF was insisting very much on this reform and it was also one of the markers uh, about receiving the IMF support in previous years. As far as I know, as the authors of this reform um, were international experts together with uh, some Ukrainian experts from uh, Ukrainian NGO sector. And then some also member of parliaments uh, joined, uh, joined this. Uh, but, but the real problem, why it has happened in this way, was that uh, uh, NGO experts consider state as deeply corrupt. So idea was that uh, supervisory board should uh, make the companies independent from the state, which actually is an owner of the company. And that's why uh, they decided to uh, connect board to the company, not to the independent payment, for example, made by some state funds or other things. So this was a result of this biased, uh, biased approach, which actually is very popular in Ukraine. And, uh, and, and the problem of the Western foundation and, and uh, organization is also that they are too much biased about this, that everything is corrupted. But uh, let's, let's follow to what to do and uh, what is right to do. Not, not uh, right is to, uh, to make pressure on Ukraine uh, saying that you uh, failed uh, this reform uh, based on case of Neftogaz. We failed this reform uh, in general. And, and so it failed 
uh, not 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 yesterday, not last week. It it's failed a year ago and uh, and two years ago they start to fail. Not I have to say that from the beginning it's not it was not a failed reform. From the beginning it was a good. Uh, start, especially the same nafta gas has shown good results and other companies. But later, the, some conspiracy appeared between boards and, and the top management companies. And now we have these huge problems, uh, especially not only in nafta gas, but in other companies, because our, our, our Ukrainian railway company uh, has no manager now and is totally in default. They even have no money to buy uh, get, get, get gas for uh, moving uh, trains. So the, the result is now is to put uh, new changes uh, to, uh, to, to add new amendments to the laws, which would uh, make more uh, independent boards from the top management when, uh, where we can uh, put some indicators and the right to change not effective member of boards with, for example, independent nomi uh, nomination committee, but uh, it, it should it, we, we have to understand how to evaluate the work of any member of every member, because otherwise there is also not uh, I would say uh, is this irresponsible to uh, to the people appoint without any any KPI. So this is I would say that everybody should focus how to strengthen this reform and the case of NAFTA gas is a trigger. To bring this reform to a successful uh, way, not a, a, a trigger to take it back, uh, because if we would, for example, uh, play back, it will be not the good case. Thanks very much, uh, Victor. Uh, our next question comes from Andrew Andrew Neff, and he talks about the he has a question about the optics of sacking Kobolyov. Uh, that the optics were very bad from a Western perspective. Why didn't the government simply put its decision to the supervisory board? And if the board rejected the decision, then sus suspend the board and fire Kobolov. So Zayon wanted to talk about the process and the ramifications of that process for these reforms. Andrian. Actually, the decision was to uh... Um, considered the government found um, the work of supervisory board as uh, uh, as bad, uh, and they actually um, well they not fired, but they stopped uh, power of the supervisory board, and they uh, fired um, Kovalev. So I think um, if the manner uh, of doing this wasn't so quick. Uh, I believe that um, perception of this step would be a little bit another as well. So uh, regarding future uh, reforms, it was right. Uh, so, um, so uh, as I said, uh, considering that Vitrenko and Koboli were part of the team uh, which started reforming NAFTA House in 2014, and both of them are dedicated to market principles. Uh, I believe that uh, Witrenko will continue the process of the um, reforming of the company and the and gas market. More than that, uh, Witrenko is in the situation when he's urged to, um, speed, uh, to speed up the pace uh, of his success. Because otherwise, uh, if he doesn't uh, demonstrate uh, good results, um, he will be blamed that he was the key reason who failed the process, who failed the uh, uh, has a success. Uh, and uh, so I see that in the case of Vitrenko, uh, we have a very good chance to uh, see uh, Nafta has uh, with good results in the future. Thank you, uh, Andrian. Our next question comes from Salman Zahir, who is a consultant at the World Bank. And he asked, do international partners, IFIs, not pay enough attention to the details and substance of reforms? So what, what, what is the role of foreign companies and foreign IFIs to monitor the situation and to actually try to change the situation? Any takers? May I? So, yes, uh, Pablo and then uh, Natalia. 
Yeah, so what, what oh. the, the first thing I would propose to make uh, an independent report about what was going on with, this, um, with the corporate management reform during the last five years. And uh, based on this report, which we will uh, include all the facts actually and that I mentioned and other stories, they, there should be made some recommendations on how to improve the things, uh, how they should work. So I would say that this is the best and uh, the way how uh, international organization could could uh, act in, and, and help to resolve this crisis which has happened. Uh, Hello, and then oh, yeah. we all understand uh, why why it's happened. It's about egos. It's about uh, access to. Uh, not NAFTA gas accounts for different uh, reasons, political related reasons. And it's about uh, possible introducing of a different kind of tariffs. So uh, let's call it uh, social style tariffs. Uh, and a couple of other, other reasons. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's about uh, big stuff. It's gonna play uh, a lot in, in, uh, in Ukrainian future politics. So fundamentally, we have one point on corporate governance, uh, which uh, Victor has just mentioned. Another one, how would you start uh, sorting out the problem in real time? Because otherwise we're gonna have resignation of the advisory council and the, pro the problem uh, gets deeper. And at the end of the day, uh, it's uh, it going to be also an argument for the Russians to say, uh huh, it's a kind of mess. Uh, it's, uh, it's about uh, yourself not, uh, not being reliable. So, why to take you in the European energy equations? So, it's, uh, it's not just about internal staff, it's also about uh, international politics. So I do believe IFIs and our friends and partners uh, have a role here. It's, uh, it's important uh, to, uh, to be in contact with them. Uh, fundamentally, the decision is ours uh, and it's about our company. But the whole backbone in our economy signals uh, that uh, we need a kind of different, uh, different contact and a good one, an effective one. Natalia. Uh, I suppose I'll make a final also uh, final conclusion. So everything depends. Uh, so whether they should ask or oversight reform, I mean, international organization or not, it depends how much they will involved into in this implementation. For instance, uh, if I am uh, IMF uh, uh, invest or uh, gives cheap resources, uh, uh, European Bank of Reconstruction Development invest in some kind of businesses, for sure they actually were interested to get their returns back and uh, to understand the system works well. But the success of any reform, and uh, I'm actually uh, believe uh, uh, that uh, it depends on people who are behind this uh, uh, reform. For instance, gas reform is a big success in Ukraine, and we push, uh, push it not only through parliament, but implement it into real life. And real people was behind this uh, process. Electricity market reform, vice versa, we enacted good law according to the international standards, third energy package, uh, EU uh, third energy package but it's still not implemented because there is was lack of uh, will because it was a little bit late when we enacted this law so a uh, corporate governance reform it was voted designed in very good uh, uh, manner but uh, uh, the success of separate uh, supervisory board depends on people who was elected uh, uh, into these boards and how they perform their duties. So I think the process of selection should be very, very at high level and careful and uh, uh, any person who uh, care about the reputation um, in this board, they will perform well because it's their reputation and uh, they live in this uh, uh, very, very small energy world. So I think personality matters and how this reform implemented would depend on the will and uh, people who are behind this reform. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'm going to have Andrian give the final word. 
Um, but I also want to ask a question that he can address, and that is, to what extent does Zelensky have the political power and the political will to push these reforms forward? Um, this is kind of the second crisis that has been on his watch. The previous one that I've dealt with is the Constitutional Court and kind of unilaterally declaring some of the anti-corruption legislation uh, illegal. So in, in terms of your final thoughts, is Zelensky, does he have the political will? Does he have the power to forge these reforms? Um, and if not, what are the consequences? Thanks, Will. Uh, so I do believe that he has enough leverages uh, to, uh, to move things ahead. And uh, regarding political will, well, uh, watching uh, yesterday's press, uh, press conference together with Secretary Blinken, it looks like that now he will have more motivation and more political will to, uh, to do with this. So let's uh, let's uh, hope for the best. And uh, I, I, I still believe that we will see some good changes and reforms uh, soon. Thank you very much, Andrian. Uh, we've come to the end of our session, but I would like to uh, thank you all for tuning in to our discussion and, <clears throat> and thank our panelists as well. And we look forward to seeing you at future Kennan Institute events. So thanks very much.